So as I mentioned earlier, I am banning myself, other than my talk, I'm banning myself from a microphone for at least a month for various reasons. And I'm not emailing anything publicly for at least a month. So Sunil and uh, Moon will take over. Hi. Okay, so I think we would recap. And um, I'm, I only have like three hours of sleep, so. All right, let me see if I could uh, try to recap. Um, <laughs> a lot of people talked. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, we, we, had a, we had a fun discussion, I guess, ultimately. Um, there's a whole bunch of different things that we talked about. I, and honestly, I'm not at all prepared to share what we actually talked about because uh, in one ear, out the other, so to speak. Um, but anyway, bottom line in the end, wh what we want to be able to do is to go beyond just uh, the talk and put it into paper. There are a couple frameworks that we're going to try to work on. One is around how do we, um, I, I think some of the proposals that we'll come around with is essentially f uh, finding ways to bound the problem um, by, for example, looking at what is the attacker space and what can the attacker do in this bounded space. We want to be able to bound the problem because uh, once we can bound the problem, we know what that space looks like, and it, it becomes our territory in that bounded space. We oftentimes struggle in defeating the adversary because we offer, uh, we have an unbound, we, we think we have an unbounded problem, and thus we don't really understand what we need to be able to uh, apply to solve that problem. And uh, the more we can bound it, the more successful we will be. Um, let's see. Anyway, I, I here, we're gonna go back and forth so I can, uh, yeah, my notes. Sure. Um, yeah, so our track operations is always all over the place. That's just kind of how it is. We don't have a central theme of bounding the enemy or whatever it is this year. Um, so uh, I think we're all sort of trying to bound the enemy at all times. Um, so I, I viewed this morning and this afternoon's talks as the strongest talks we've had at this conference yet. So as, especially as a, as a collection, I'm super impressed with what you've all got going on today, and I was I was very happy to be a part of what's going on today. It's been it's been awesome. You know, there's it's all downhill from here. If you're on day two, you're a B minus at best at this point. You're just not you're just not gonna make it. Um, so yeah, so a lot of the stuff that we looked at this morning were a lot of open source projects. So we were looking at Phoenix, which we, is sort of the second talk that we've all had about Phoenix. Um, I don't know how many people in here have actually tried the easy button. Anybody besides me? No? Do you guys even know what the easy button is? Who doesn't know what the easy button is? Raise your head. Okay, JB, and you guys, like, you need to up your game on that one. I don't even know where you are. Um, so, uh, Fien there you are. Yeah, you got you to gotta explain what the easy button is better next time. Um, so, the easy button is like, how many people have tried to deploy Cuckoo at all? Okay, and how many people, now put your hand down if it is no longer running. Right? Okay, so uh, so the easy button is the idea of going, you know, hey, this is an automated process. It's remotely the same for everybody. You go and you type in as easy button, you hit go, it asks you a few questions, and it deploys Cuckoo for you, right? Like, that's the entire point of this conference when focused exactly on Cuckoo. Um, and it's the same thing uh, when John Altas was talking. You know, he comes up and he presents Ben Reardon's work at his own work. It's, I like the slide that you had where you were talking about, like, it's the, it's the you know, everyone's climbing on the, the shoulders of the person before them. And so you're like, here's all the work we did on JE3, and then look, here's the next escalation of it. And so I sat there and I thought, like, I wonder what the next one's going to look like. Are we going to just start prototyping all the different types of things where people wrote their own custom, you know, because like TLS is kind of ubiquitous when you start talking about the web layer, but you get into like, you know, IMAP and things like that, you start to get, get into SMTPS, can we start prototyping those and looking for servers, rogue servers and stuff like that for redirections, and I thought that was just, that was a super interesting slide, and it kind of opened up this whole thought beyond like, hey, we should really deploy this in our, you know, more than just running the tool. Um, but yeah, I, th I thought that was just fantastic. Uh, who else, what I got to go this morning? Um, I think that like Eric Capuano's talk, I, like he talked last year as well, and I think I did the same thing this year to him that I did last year to him, where I was like, you got 20 minutes, go, you know, and, and he's really got like a two hour talk that could, could spread out over like, let's look at this whole system of how we handle our security information, and let's start trying to like boil that down into something where not only is it reliable, which I don't know about the rest of you guys, but for us is a super uh, issue, because we rely a large part on Splunk that we don't control that's super expensive. And so every time I try and stick something in it, I get a frowny face from my boss who then goes, do you really want to do that? And I'm like, yeah, I really want to do that. And then we go talk to the Splunk team and 
they're not happy at all that I want to do what I'm doing. So, um, you know, trying to like take control of your own logging stuff and trying to take control of your own ecosystem from, from one end to the other is just a fantasy of mine, but I'm working there every day as I'm certain many of you are. So I thought that there was a lot of good takeaways in that as well. Um, I'm gonna hand this back to Sunil if he's done looking at his notes. <laughs> yeah. That was one talk I wanted to uh, to listen to, which, yes. So can I actually someone recap that for the philosophy track? Because it's that was actually worth <laughs> recapping. Yeah, so I can I can TLDR it for you, which is they got hit by a really cool attack on how, like, functionally they interact at a DNS level, but more than that with both their customers and themselves. Um, and so I was talking with JB during that track, as I'm prone to talk during everybody's track, unfortunately. Um, and so I was like, there's no way we would have ever detected this. There's no way, like, if they, like it's not just, they got, they, got, they got attacked, they got DNS hijacked. The DNS hijacker changed, the, uh, changed how their mail system pointed for one hour and then changed it back. And then I saw the dates, but he didn't really go through a date timeline, and maybe he can't share that yet. But I was like, are we ever going to detect, like, that changed for an hour, like, maybe a day out of a two-week period? And then it went, like, like I could a thousand percent understand his explanation where he was like, our mail just wasn't working. And we went, well, maybe something's going on. And then an hour later, it fixed itself. And then he was like, okay, no big deal. Wouldn't you know. Hmm? Uh, it would have, well... Okay, so he, the question is, would that have showed up in certificate transparency? And so the thing that I thought about, I thought about that. And so what I, what I ended up with, with a conclusion of was it really just depends on the size of, your, size of your enterprise. For us, if we were just like, oh, the certificate's changed, we need to set off an alert, or you guys, a certificate changed, and you set off an alert, that's all you do all day, every day on expired certificates, not to mention like certificates that just got changed. No, the real indicator, and he said it within five seconds, was, it changed, and you're, rock, you're watching that serial number, and then it changed back. You know, and you're like, oh, wait a minute. Yeah. Changed back is the tell. Like, <laughs> you mean like? <laughs> I'm not. Okay, well, they didn't do it to me, but they didn't actually do an exploit. They acquired the EPP code so that they could actually talk to the registrar and the wholesale registrar and transfer the domains. But I mean, were they setting up for a business email compromise? No, that, so I, I'm, I'm going to let, I don't want to talk outside of school because I don't fully understand what the packet clearinghouse does for a living, and I'm not going to speak authoritatively outside of that. But uh, effectively, the, the boil down of that was they attacked them as a placement attack because they do DNS for 500 different Top level or uh, top level domain CC TLDs, all this type of stuff, and so they wanted to have control over that so that they could attack somebody else. That was the gist of that part. Um, so yeah, but I'm, hopefully he comes back in, and, and I would love to have him do five more minutes and be like and answer your guys's questions. Do what? Yeah, he deserves a ton of beer. Like he sw he came in, and he's like, "Can I switch my talk?" And he kind of gave like a boiled down version. I went, "Yes, I wish every talk was that talk. Like that was amazing." Yes. Yeah. Um, all right, so <coughs> we uh, we had a couple of other talks. So we, we had we had a discussion with Bryson about um, again defining that attack discrete attacker space. We had Aaron <coughs> talk about um, the different ways that attackers. Uh, so I, I thought Aaron's talk was particularly interesting in the sense of answering, trying to answer uh, Vixie's question from last year around internet superbugs. What allows us to actually kill superbugs? Okay. Uh, and so he did this analysis of um, different types of actions that we take and ultimately d determine what actually kills the superbugs. And it turns out it's diplomacy and arrests. Pretty much everything else just uh, creates superbugs. Yes. So, uh, I mean, takedowns are great, but until you actually literally take down the person uh, or the, organ or the uh, country in some sort of way, then it really doesn't matter. Um, yeah, it's, I, well, the example that I think he pointed out was the China one, which had some effect, but not lasting, right? So <clears throat> then I had a, um, we had we had like three people drop out uh, due to various issues. So I stepped in, had a talk on um, 
uh, new paradigms for a new era, and basically saying that in the next era, 2020s, we're going to have to focus on resiliency, and we have a new paradigm for how we want to look at resiliency, and it's based on three core principles that counter the confidentiality, integrity, availability constructs that we have in security. So instead of confidentiality, integrity, and availability, we want distributed, immutable, and ephemeral, or D-I-E, die. And the pr basic premise is we want more of our assets to be uh, killed or to die and um, be treated in a, in a sense as a way that it be treated like, um, I'm not sure if people know the puppies versus cattle analogy, but basically treat them like cattle, uh, don't care if they die, move on, so on speak. All right. And then the other part was uh, our last talk. Um, I don't know how many of you guys ended up sticking around for it. It was just baller, like listening to Craig and Ashish talk about what they're doing at Berkeley Lab, where they're like, we have this problem. Like they described functionally like Ryan Moon's horrific nightmare network scenario, where they're like, we don't have a firewall, we don't have a proxy, and the users get to bring in whatever they want, and if I tell them they can't, they yell at me. You know, and so like, and so I'm like, wow, like what a challenge. And like their approach is like, we're just gonna go full baller and write our own routing software and we're gonna do it in C because that's what we do and we work on it for 20 years. And, and, and like you look at their goals, like my goal would be please work, please, do, I need budget, please don't get yelled at. And they're like, we want it down at 10 millisecond response time. You know, I'm just, I thought that whole presentation was baller. Like it reminded me of like, I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with the tree of woe, um, like that me and Nathan wrote when we worked at Zons and we put it out and it was basically like watching logs across the network and then if people interacted with it badly, then we, we just banned them. We kept a running database of all of our customers because again, we had a firewall and we had a proxy and we had this thing where you had to have a bank account and uh, so we could do that. But I mean, I thought, I thought that was awesome. Okay. And then we also had Amy Jordan. Can Amy, is she here still? Ah, good. Amy, I've, raise your hand again. So Amy um, just came back from the, uh, the World Economic Forum last week and you are the director of, okay, well anyway. Okay, yeah, so she, ha she plays a central part in, um, in running or helping stand up the cybersecurity center for the WEF. And so uh, I, I think the opportunity to partner directly with someone who can help shape what that's gonna be, that is awesome. Okay, so to be able to connect with uh, Amy and just talk about Hey, how can we as a um, as a community contribute to shaping that uh, at, at really at the highest levels of government and and industry? Hey, that's what this is about. So, you want to say something? <laughs> okay. I, 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 I'll say something and apologize after. So, as one tends to. A couple more things. Thanks again to the sponsors today. First of all, Dell for having us. You know, we have somebody here who's been working all day long just to make sure it's cold and hot again and cold again and hot again. And she's been running around and... I, I think that like Randy said, John needs to give her a raise. You know, just, say, no, just a hint. There you go. And uh, then we need to thank also Jason and EA for giving us lunch and Sunil here for taking care of breakfast. It's, we're, we're playing with the sponsor thing. I mean, last year everybody was anonymous, and anon anonymous sponsors for a conference is kind of amazing, but we figured, you know, they're giving us money. Let's give them a little bit of respect, so say they're hiring. Um, lastly, Randy Vaughn. So I'm not sure how many of you have had a chance to actually work or exchange email with Randy. Does, did anybody here have the chance to exchange emails with Randy or whatever? So if you did, you can't be here today. Maybe tomorrow, we're not really sure. Do me a favor. Personally, open up your phone, send him a thank you email, and how much you would have liked to see him. For me personally, it would have been it'd be really amazing of you to send Randy. Yes, what? He does not need a ride. Although he lives in Waco, so. He lives in Waco. I am serious. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, Randy is amazing. If you guys can email, so this year, honestly, none of us had a lot of time. I wasn't as involved as I should be. Randy made this all happen, and of course, you did. <laughs> so if you can, um, you know, not, you can shake his hand, but send him an email and say thank you. They'll be amazing. And on that note, unless we have something to add, I think we can go to Finley's and have some beers and talk to each other and stuff. Bring your badge with you tomorrow. Yeah, use the same badge, don't forget it. And thank you very much for today. I appreciate it and we all appreciate it. Oh yeah, and the session, of course, the session heads 
Moon here and Sunil, say thank you to them as well because they didn't drink even water all day long. So. Thanks. <laughs>